Hey investors, Chase here from the Node MBA podcast. We are here at the Paper Source uh, seminars, the Paper Source Expo here in Las Vegas. And instead of doing a traditional show this week, we thought we would do a live QA with some of the people that we just met at the event, some of the people who are listeners of the show that happen to be out at the event. The audio is as good as we could get it. It is super busy. We did it, uh, you know, like I said, live on the exhibit hall floor. We talked about all kinds of things from the importance of goals and mindset to how to get started in the business, where people are at, where to get deals. We cover a lot of ground. It's a super cool opportunity that we had, and we appreciate everyone that was able to make it out live and uh, stick around for our little roundtable session so we could get this recorded. Thank you all so much. Anyway, without further ado, here's this week's show of the Node MBA podcast. You don't think it'll be a, you don't think it'll be a problem? <laughs> all right. Very good. Oh, man. All right. Uh, I'm recording. I'm recording. I'm recording. All right. Well, very cool. All right. So, so what do you guys want to talk about? We have uh, Happy Friday. <laughs> it's Friday, right? It's Saturday? Uh, it's Friday. Friday. It's Friday. It's a good Friday. Everybody's talking about their favorite sessions so far today. Okay. I thought what we could do is our first ever live Q&A, potentially, unless you have something you want to... Does anybody else have a better idea? Because we need all the good ideas we can get. <laughs> every single, like every single week. We'll tell you guys you, to send us ideas so you think we're kidding. The due diligence bit, yeah, go for it. Due diligence, due diligence bro. bro. Okay, so I guess this is a good episode to launch it. This is, yeah, this is the episode to launch it. Yeah. So, two different things. A lot of the stuff we go through the whole due diligence. Everybody's like, where do we start? That software that we created is truly the first place we start once we actually have a tape of assets. So it answers kind of two questions for new investors. What are we using? Those eight websites are exactly what I use when I start due diligence. So I'm just going to load them up. Uh, when you guys start looking at tapes, 150, 200, 300 assets, over time you will narrow them down just for markets. You'll have a general idea of states you want to buy in, cities you want to buy in, and go from there. Okay, it's condensed. Let's say now we're down to 100 assets. You're going to start high level. That software is just really easily meant to reduce the time I spend getting the data I need to really look at it. Honestly, after doing and looking at so many, once the addresses are in and I have all of those websites up, I may spend two and a half to three minutes per asset. And that's gonna tell me when I look at those numbers, I look at the addresses around it, we're gonna get on Zillow, we're gonna go down and look at the comps. And yeah, they're old, yeah, they're good. Yes, it's Zillow. It's good, bad, and the ugly. It's kinda like anything else. We're gonna take all those things. If it's good, I'm gonna throw my ROI calculator. If it's not, I'm gonna close all those eight tabs, I'm gonna copy another address, throw it in there, and load it all up. For us, the reason that software exists, it saves me 30 seconds to a minute of not opening a bunch of tabs. And everybody's like, oh, that's no big deal. Well, I like to pay myself for time. And we always talk about not doing MWAs or minimum wage activities. And opening up browser windows is kind of a minimum wage activity. Yeah. It doesn't take a whole lot of work. So that's why we got that thing. Yeah, I mean, it allows you to take, like you said, it's that high level, right? You're gonna bust out a tape that's got 100. You're gonna probably take 50 out because it's not in state you're looking at. And then the next 50, you're gonna slam with that down to 10 that matter, and then you can start to really hammer on the 10. Call for, actually call for taxes instead of just trusting whatever pops up from the, the, uh, the county on that. And that essentially gets your bids in faster for uh, uh, you know sellers that matter on that. And for ones that, like, uh, like Paul Burkett, he does a great job, and he kind of sandbags a little. He says, you know, we'll start accepting bids here to here, basically, right? He'll give you the window. And you can get that in sooner for him here and then move on to whatever the next tape is, the next job is. Obviously, you can do more marketing, which I always love to talk about, but whatever the next task is, just get you to that task. So who has a note at this table? Who owns a note and who wants a note? Show of hands, we have a note. For those on the video, no hands went up in the air. It was very embarrassing for everybody in paper. It was a slow crawl. This is like... Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Okay, that's called a note business. It's a so note business. Yeah. Yeah. So everybody wants to buy their first note. Is, is that, is that mostly right where we're at? Right okay, so let's fire yeah, away there we go. questions. Yeah. What do you guys want to hear about buying your first note? Where are you getting roadblocks? You don't have capital, you don't have the tapes, you don't know what, you just don't know what, and then there's some expletives that I think are usually blocked out on the yeah. intro to the podcast. Yeah, yeah the podcast has expletives. Is that kind of where we're at? Yeah, yeah, what you said, right? Where do you find tapes? Okay, so there are three people, first or seconds, there's people in this room, there's vendors, and guys that are running around that have access to tapes. 
So the tapes are in this room. So part of that goes back to networking. Everybody has business cards on, hopefully. Some people gave them all away, and we're not going to point any fingers at those people. Sometimes you just tell people you're out of business cards because you don't want extra email. It happens. I'm just saying. I've never done that. I always have tons of this business cards. Is so tapes. The tapes are in this room. So that's that. If you've listened to all the episodes, thank you. That's horrible because it's a ton of time. If you did it in a month when somebody just told me they listened to all of the episodes in the last, like, literally four weeks. I was. It's only 72 hours. Weeks. Okay. I appreciate it. I, that's, a, that's a dedication. It is to only to 72 hours. Of, I mean, listen. So getting to know, getting to, have you gotten tapes in yet, Ryan? Have you looked at I, tapes? I signed up. I literally started this six weeks ago. Okay. So I uh, signed up with um, PPR. Okay. PPR, yeah, good, good. Dave Van Hoor. Yeah. And I just got, um, I, I went through some, I guess, old tapes. Yeah. And yeah. just started just sitting down trying to do what I thought was due diligence, just on old stuff, just to kind of work it out to see how it goes. Okay. Learning the process right. on some tapes. Right. We've had Dave on the show before. It's great, Dave. So I like that you said you were looking at old tapes. It's almost, is anybody familiar with like paper trading in the stock market? Yeah. Okay, so think of it kind of that way. So you can't go wrong with it until I realize all the ones I should have bought that I didn't, and then realize I bought these ones and I was like, oh, what I did. <laughs> but getting the tapes, I, I, it's, it's a chicken and the egg. This whole business, everything that we really deal with, like when we got started, it's this chicken and the egg mentality. Do I have the deals or do I have the money? And then when I have the money, is that a good deal? And then when you get the deal, is there good collateral? Can you close on it? Do you have, is it the right city? How do you pick what cities you guys are buying in? You know, when we got started, I was buying in cities where I had family members or where I was at. So I was leveraging resources. It's the same way of saying, I don't have any money. Dad's got money, mom's got money, Uncle Joe's got money, the weird neighbor down the street's got no kids and I think he's got money. We're all scrambling to find those things. If I was starting from scratch again, I would take two big things away from this. This room has a ton of experienced people and tons of access to notes. But your systems and how you do it, when you look back in a year from now and you look back at this time and go, well, what did I do or how did I get started or what was I looking at, is truly your system. So getting a tape in and looking at it. Let's say I give you a tape with 500 assets. What is the first thing you do besides go, what in the is in front of me. How are you guys gonna decide where your markets are at? So, give me an idea, Mark. For you, what's your market? Do you well, know your I, market? I run it through an ROI calculator that I've kind of made. All 500. What's the first thing you okay, do? Okay, the first thing I do is, yeah, I'll, I'll split it up into the markets that I think I wanna go after, although I- Okay, so let's there. go with that, you yeah. think. What's the thinking part? What, well, how did, give me three of those markets. Um, Missouri, which is where I'm from, okay. it's obvious. Great. Makes sense, um, geographically uh, close. South Carolina, and let's say, why would we let say Illinois? I don't know. Because there's a lot of tapes there. So not Illinois. Because because there's assets there. Yeah. Okay. So that's you you feel like there's not is there any other states you like that you want to go? Yeah. The reason he's asking is there's assets in New York and New Jersey. Why not there? Because those are judicial states and they okay. take a real long time to You know about that on. maybe Illinois state? It, it's pretty it's a, long. It's too. a judicial state. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so a lot of that is there's no right answer. Talk to anybody else in this room that bought notes, they probably can't give you a great answer for either their first or their fifth or their 50th note of going, oh, I don't know why I bought it. Three months ago, I bought notes in Evansville, Indiana, in New Orleans, that I never should have bought in Aurora, Illinois. Why? For me, I saw dollar signs, and I, I steered away from my systems, and I went away from what I was doing, because let's be honest, most everybody's here not to lose money, or we're here to make more money to get out of our W-2 jobs or do something else. So I was focusing on dollar signs and not systems. Do you know where Owensboro is? Yeah, you have to take Allegiant yeah. Airlines yeah. to get yeah. there. <laughs> so let's just say that's the only way for me to get to Evans or Evansville, and I've now learned that's a big mistake. So part of it is really continuing to think through what you're buying, why are you buying there, what are you doing? But getting tapes, anybody have any questions about how to get tapes in this room now? Or do you like truly believe that there's tapes in here that you can go get? They, they will have unique mix of makeup because here's what's gonna happen. Out of two people in this, there's two big firms in this room that I've bought from in the last month. I have seen assets that I could buy for $5,000 and I have one in my own backyard that's about an $800,000 acquisition on a single family. 
So you're going to see a little bit of everything. The information you're going to get is pretty much going to be about the same. If you see a lot more of them, you'll realize there's some more information to ask for. Only first, for me, personally. Now, if Quan does seconds, he does a great job of it. Uh, a bunch of people at Main Street buy seconds. Kathy, like, Kathy, Kathy over buys at Pat, seconds. PAC does seconds as well. I don't have a bad thing to say about him. I've never put a dollar into a second, so I don't have a good thing to say about him either. It's just I got good people that I know that do it, so we're not the we're not a good resource on seconds. But yeah. There's tons of stuff out there. Are you buying I only buy non-performing because the yields that you can get in a performing is somebody else made the money off of work I know how to do. So there's nothing wrong with that and that goes back to figuring out your why and what your business plan is and your system. So when you're talking about for anybody, it doesn't make it wrong. I have clients whose money that I have invested where it's not a JV deal. They want 8% on their money. And I can give them 8% all day long on a bad rental deal that I've got somewhere else. Their system is I want somebody else to manage my money and I want 8% and I'm happy. So part of that is figuring out what your yields are and what you expect. To where Mark, you yep. talked about having an ROI calculator. Spend some time with Excel. If you're not good with Excel, find somebody that's good with Excel. If you can't do that, take a piece of printer paper and make a formula for how you guys are gonna figure out your deals. Because the biggest challenge now when we talk about this chicken and the egg and how are you evaluating, because the next thing you need to do is figure out what are you gonna offer. And it's nice to have a dartboard, but I don't know that there's dartboards that cover throwing at these notes. And you need to have a system to how are you evaluating, how are you pricing the deal. A really nice one. So that's a unique yeah. thing. It's, yeah. Just, yeah. it's for me, a range, 10 to 40%. Because there's no top end number, because here's yeah. the catch. You don't know who your seller is sometimes in the sense of they don't know what I know and I don't know what they know. So we have deals, I, I have deals that have come out of last year that we made 50%. Last month I just lost 70 grand on a deal. So my yield was definitely not appropriate on that one and that just came from bad information. And that'll come to another thing we'll talk about in a second. But that yield that I target, I'm targeting it for a bunch of different reasons. You're not, no, I mean this in the nicest way, but you're probably not gonna hang out in the same Chicago neighborhood that I am, right? So, you know, it's you a little know. more dangerous, so you may, you she know. Might, she might have some skills you don't know about. Take, take a clock, but. So part of it is just, what do you want? What are you buying? And, and that comes back to figuring out your why, your states, where you're at, and what the reasons are. So if you feel like you wanna build a portfolio of re-performers for yourself, don't buy a note on anything that's vacant. That's how you get rid of that list from 500 down to 200. And then you start looking at your states and now you're down to 150. And then you go, I don't like condos. Now you're down to 100. And you go, I don't want anything that's less than two beds. I only want three beds and two beds. And they got 18 notes to look at. You should be able to do diligence by the time that next episode of CSI Miami's done. And just breeze right through it. But part of that breezing through it is having the ROI calculator, because that just streamlines your time. At first, you can do it by hand and sketch it out. But when I got started, I had great trading. I was very happy with my trading. I went to a big trainer, everybody knows their name. But then afterwards, there's a lot of the other stuff that they don't talk about. You know, I'm looking at a deal, yeah, you need to look up taxes. That's great. So let's say taxes on a property are $3,000 behind, and property taxes are $2,000 a year. What I didn't think about was the fact that that was an asset in Ohio or Illinois, and I'm going to hold that asset for another year and a half just to get done with foreclosure. Well, not only do I have $3,000 in arrears, I'm going to incur $3,000 of taxes while I'm holding it, which, wait a second, I just went and I bought a $30,000 note because I wanted to be really secure in my first deal and I want to put a ton of money out there. That $3,000 I missed from my taxes of not having an ROI calculator to kind of automatically kind of tell me I needed to put that number in there, that's 10% of your yield right off the top from one simple line item you didn't even think about. Force placed insurance. Are you going to insure it? You don't have to. If it's JV's money or somebody else's money, you can probably insure it, but you need to have a line item for that. We look at things, you know, one of the big challenges you guys are going to have when you're looking at ROI calculators, in my opinion, the deals we have. The people you're going to be buying from, the sellers, it's like any other market. Who brings you a brand new Porsche and offers it to you at the price of a Corolla? Right? So here's the catch. The outside may look like a Porsche, but if you're not allowed to turn the engine over, does it have a kitchen? You know? 
We just bought a note on a 3,900 square foot house in Atlanta. And the house from the outside is beautiful. Every place in the neighborhood is worth about $450,000, $500,000. It's nicer than any house I personally had the pleasure of living in. I've rented a few that nice, but I, you know, but I don't know what the inside of that house looks like. There's no rental pictures, there's none of that stuff. So part of it is also, are you know you're gonna have to have rehab? Well, at the end of the day, we almost always know there's gonna be carpet or paint or something like that. So if you don't have a background in real estate and renovation, you need to start looking around at what is a safe estimate of what is gonna cost you to rehab a property. You know, if I'm in Florida, I can almost do a full rehab at $33 a square foot. Now, as long as I don't have to put a roof on it, and I don't have to do electric and replumb it, but I can do a new kitchen, a new bathroom, new appliances, new flooring, new painting, inside out landscaping, it's about 33 bucks a square foot. That one is a unique deal that I'll probably try to negotiate cash for keys and I'll get the seller to just give me the house. Uh, there's a, it's a lot of equity in that deal, so it's kind of unique. But look at your IRR calculator and how do you figure those things out? Renovation costs, you know, as much as the sellers want to tell you that this is ARV pricing and you're going to pay retail because that's how the market works, that's how the market prices these things at. Well, let's go back to the re-performing versus performing. A vacant property is rarely going to be in mint condition. You know, you should just know that off the bat. So, we're going back to due diligence and we're talking about the whole aspect of how we're going to price it and what are we building in. Who on your team is going to go look at a property? When you're talking about your markets, and you got to build your team. I have a contractor I'd throw off a roof if I found him right now in Ohio. Wouldn't think twice. Some people have asked about him. Yeah, I, <laughs> but I have a contractor in Chicago. That, you know, he doesn't make anywhere near as much money as he should, and he makes a ton of money just because he's that good. So part of it's where's your team at? Do you have good realtors? Do you have good contractors? Do you have relatives on the ground? One of the deals for me that we've talked about a little bit, I sent a cousin out to go look at a property. I didn't know he didn't get out of the car. I didn't know those pictures were from his car from the street because it was a rough neighborhood. Okay, that's fine. Whose fault is that? 100% mine, because I didn't tell him what to do. I didn't go look at the property. So what you guys are doing due diligence and thinking things like that. That property that I took a big old bath on last month, I didn't go see it. I bought an expensive note in an expensive neighborhood, and I trusted my realtor. But well, what did my realtor do? My realtor gave me the retail price of what he thought he would do if he's going to list it. The same thing most realtors do that don't work with investors. So that's, I think when you're getting started and you're getting your note, man, I fully understand wanting to be in your backyard or be in a place you want to travel to. I would tell anyone now, if I look at my business, can I get a direct flight there? Can I get a direct flight at a reasonable price? Can you get those uh, those anywhere miles in like uh, Southwest, like a, like a sixty nine you know sixty nine dollar round trip kind of game? Well, that's a different thing. Cause I argue that if you're really gonna do this business, oh my gosh, you're build business, business, cards and points. fly first class. Fly anyway, first class. listen, just as I have a direct flight, fly that's first the class. That's all I'm gonna say. I've raised more money in first class than I could spend in a year flying first class by being the guy in shorts and a t-shirt yeah. in first class. Listen to the guy from Microsoft in his suit that has to go to a meeting going, what do you do? Because I would love to do that. So, these, I think those are all the biggest things to think about. You know, the ROI calculator, you're going to massage that thing. It should be a living thing. It's going to change because if I'm in Chicago, my risk profile for my insurance provider is way different than I'm in like a complete, if I'm in suburban Connecticut, is my, what I'm paying for insurance is completely different. You need to really pay attention to those things. And I think new investors, that's the biggest place you get tripped up. You don't know what you don't know from expenses. Are you buying condos? Pay attention to the HOA fees. Look when you're going through. One of the other biggest things, and we'll get to next level because we're kind of jumping around with it. The due diligence evaluation is great. Send your bid, but let's talk about bidding. Who's actually submitted some bids on some notes? And what was the feedback? Not, I mean, literally never got anything back. So you bid too low. Yeah. Did you? It's like a date, though. Did you ever follow up and ask why not? I, I, I did, but I didn't get a phone call back. So. So you gotta keep calling. Yeah. Sometimes it's like dating. It's that fun, to be honest. Like, it really is. You know. Um, Pricing, you hear everybody's got a different opinion from pricing. It's because everybody's got different sources. Everybody also has different backgrounds. You know, if you talk to Chaz, 
They don't need a proof of funds letter from me. They know I'll close on a deal. If you haven't bought a note before and they don't know your name, they don't know who you are, expect that it's not going to be easy. It, it's not meant to sound easy because the business isn't. It's, it's about building relationships, you know? Your brother comes over and needs his car, needs your car, you're going to give it to him. The neighbor down the street that you've only seen a couple times and comes ask for the car, you're going to go, no, I, I'll give you a ride. <laughs> now, a you, have you ever heard of Uber? Why are <laughs> yeah, you bothering? Yeah, yeah. It's the exact same way with buying these notes from people. They don't know you or you haven't done anything or you haven't proven a track record. That's your job. It's, it's, like I said, it's like dating. You have to prove your worth inside of the relationship and what you're, you're going to give them. I think in our opinion a lot of the time. So, initial due diligence, you put some offers out, you're going to get collateral. That's a whole different class. I would tell you, you need to get somebody from a title company. Get a friend, make a friend at a title company. They can actually, they know all these documents. They've read them. Or you're going to have to pay an attorney. And don't go to cheap routes. Remember little things? Let's say, let's say you buy an average note for $70,000. And you're paying 10% interest to your investor, so seven grand a year, six thousand and change a day. So you're paying twenty dollars a day to hold that note. Send stuff first. Send stuff next day. It takes ten days for something to show up in a regular mail. These little things that people do. You don't do a BPO for a hundred dollars. Okay. You pay a hundred dollars for a BPO. Or what he said. Can I fly out there for hundred and fifty? See it myself with the realtor that'll do it for free. Start looking at how you're investing in your business. There's a, there's a lot of not, people don't take it as seriously as they should. They talk about taking it as seriously as they should, but from a deal perspective, people get a little bit more serious, but even from like a capital raise, I mean, you gotta understand that a lot of these people that you might be raising capital from, this is all they might have, or this they've got 100 grand and they wanna give you 80 or whatever. That's a big freaking deal. Like, I, I, it blows my mind when I talk to new investors how little, how, how little seriousness they apply to things like that. Um, about understanding exactly how important it is to the, you know, you want to buy it, right? You, you follow it up, that's fine, but like again and again. The reason why he's saying you bid too low and all that kind of stuff, and they didn't follow up is because like, they can't take you seriously. And they don't mean that negatively, but that's how, that they have no choice. Because they're going to move on to the next five people that were had a little bit better, whatever the case is. But the same thing applies when you're raising capital. You've got to take it so damn seriously because this is all they got, right? They're trusting you. It's an IRA. This is a retirement account. This is, it boggles my mind. You got like certified, C, you know, the CPAs and all the certified financial planners and things like that. This is not a certified business. But you're dealing with the same accounts these people are. You really got to know your shit. Like paying for first class, you know, air, you know, for like your stuff, paying for the BPOs, doing that kind of stuff. Ugh. It sounds like you're getting nickel and dime. But you're being very diligent with someone who's trusting you with it a really big deal to them and that to me is something that bothers the crap out of with new people oh, I don't want to go pay 100 bucks for a BPO that person just gave you 200 grand go pay 100 dollars for a BPO are you kidding me you just oh, just want to anyway that part really annoys me and so again it's the same thing with seriousness with dealing with other professionals in the business you know and that's something that I feel like people that are just coming in sometimes don't quite get you know it's, it sounds great go raise 50 grand or whatever it is that's fifty thousand dollars from somebody anybody at the table just want to give me 50 grand real quick no everyone's gonna have a check rule oh, grand. This, no but if you had a good thing. note deal teed up there's it, money but it everywhere it doesn't change right so like that that to me sometimes is something that sometimes people don't really take to heart so the first no deal okay who that hasn't bought a note wants to get one is talk to somebody intimately that's done a JV with somebody else, and they know the ins and outs of how that, that deal went for them. So you got familiar with it? Yeah, we're well, very well familiar with, with how that goes on. What do you think with inside of that, when you first were getting in, was like a big takeaway from having the exposure to somebody else who's like, wait a second, you got somebody to give you $100,000 of their money to go do this business. Now, you need to be proficient in it. It's, it's, end of the day, but what was the big takeaway from how that actually occurred? It's just, it's just you know, wow, you guys really know what you're doing, that somebody's going to offer up, uh, you know, 100% of the funding and, you know, might get 40 or 50% of the profit. Yep. And that's, you know, 
there's a lot of there's a lot of uh, uh, trust in there. But you know, as I learn more about the process of what goes into the diligence and what is uh, you know, the extent of the, the knowledge and the experience and the value of that, it absolutely makes sense. Yeah. It's better than, like, you're, you're, you're comparing it now, right, to like another investment they might have put that same money into, right? Like, how much do I know about the stock? How much do I know about the CEO is going to do X, Y, Z? And in this case, you're talking about this one asset, doing the, do, the, diligence, the due diligence in this way, understanding as many of the unknowns as possible, right? right. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah. So, thoughts on challenges or next questions that come up from what we talked yeah. about? Yeah. Because you pitched it. You, it was your idea. We're leading off of your idea for one to buy a note. How do we go? So what would you want to know next, or ask next? I probably don't know, but somebody here knows. Yeah. You know, I'm so green, I only found out about this industry about six He listened to our first episode like 20 minutes ago. That's awesome, man. Yeah, all right. I appreciate it. But you're still here, so why waste the time you're here? What do you want to learn? What do you got, babe? Are you talking about... Title reports, you call somebody from a title company and you take them to a really nice meal. And I'm not, you don't, yeah. don't, you don't do the let me milk you for your time. Just literally, can I pay you for an hour of your time and then can I take you to lunch? I, uh, If you offer to pay any of these people for an hour of their time, and the best thing is, I'll t- I, whoever's listening to the podcast knows I pay myself handsomely by the hour. I don't do laundry, I don't do anything at home. There's, there's other people that will do that for you. If you ask most of these people, how much do you charge an hour? If it's not a lawyer or CPA, they're like, what do you mean? Like, can I pay you a hundred bucks to come in and ask you a bunch of questions? It will be the best hundred dollars you spend to go do it. You will never get a faster yes. Credit reports, I couldn't tell you. I just got a new one because I got my credit hacked, so LifeLock sent me one. But other than that, I don't deal with credit reports because I, you know, you can either pay the money you can't when I'm foreclosing because we're in first. Seconds, I would tell you, Sabrina's really good at it. Who else is good with the, the credit report? Kathy seconds? was talking about uh, credit reports Kathy the other day. Jeffs Kathy Jeffs was talking about credit reports the other day. Yeah. So they, they, anyone with seconds is much more versed than anyone in first because we truly don't have a need. To the only credit, credit report credit I care report. about is my own. I don't yeah. really have, yeah. And it's, and it's doing fine, just in case you're wondering, so it's all good, yeah. <laughs> For him. Thoughts, questions? Do you register as a... Uh, States, so, like, uh, like Georgia, to, to be, uh, so Georgia, where's where's Gabe at? Yeah, where's like Gabe? this because this is true. No, I just buy out of a different entity. Five yeah. new entity. Yeah. Five new entity. If they catch me or they slap my hand, I go whoop, and I go get a license with it. I'm not doing. Here's the best way. It's kind of like your taxes, where they say don't be 100 percent wrong. And does it does it pass the sniff test or the smirk test? Like, can I stand in front of a jury? with a straight face and be like, yes, I don't have a license. I bought five in this entity. And then I went and I started a new entity and we're allowed to buy five. And here are my corporate resolutions and they're individuals. So, yeah. And that's legally the way the law is. It's States like Illinois will require different types of, you know, licensing and things like that regarding like debt collection and stuff. And that's a little different, I think, than what you were asking. Yeah. Yeah. Just, you know, buy, you know, to there's different states that will have only buy five. And you do need to find out if you're going to be yeah, debt exactly. or something. I'm sure. Yeah. Uh, Illinois, I'm registered just because it also looks really good to tell everybody I have my debt buyer's license because almost everybody else that's in this business does it. Yeah. Now, most attorneys will still go do a foreclosure without it. You don't really need it. There's a lot of workarounds for it. But most people don't have a debt buyer's license because it costs $750 and they probe you to actually get it finished. And you're, you know, I don't have a trust account. You're not doing all these other things. I'm not payday loan collecting or anything else like that. It's just regulation in one of the worst states that we have to deal with that is why I like Cook County. Yeah. You know, it's the Warren Buffett quote of, you know, be greedy when others are feel, fearful, and be fearful when others are greedy. I still like Cook County because it's a pain to deal with. No one likes Cook County. Um, but yeah, I mean, you're going to have to register in other states. I mean, part of that's your business. I mean, you're going to have to register as an entity in other states. And now you've got another registered agent. You've got another $100 fee. And you've got another state filing. I mean, it's, it's truly a business for anybody that's, you know, a W-2 employee and you don't realize at the end of the year what your owner is actually doing for their company. And the administrative stuff that goes into it is still going to be part of your business that you have to do. Resources, thoughts, questions? I have a question on judicial states. Do you think there's more opportunity, or there could be a greater opportunity if you're willing to put in the time? I know you guys are, it, it, it's always velocity capital, right? Because you guys are kind of, you know, uh, you have outside investors. But if you're just managing your own funds, yeah. and you've got the time on your side a little bit, do you think the traditional states like the or looks? 
So no, and the only reason I would say that is it goes back to an ROI calculator. I invest off of a spreadsheet. If it's in the yields that I want for the duration I expect to hold it, good. So, you know, in a perfect world, you're in and out of a deal in Atlanta in six months. I mean, that's assuming a borrower doesn't file bankruptcy. You don't have to do an eviction. Your attorney doesn't screw something up. You don't have to publish. You don't have to notice by publication. In the perfect world, you can do that. In reality, you start adjusting for those factors. So I'm looking at a, an Ohio deal. If I can still net 24% on two years, then what do I care if it's a judicial state or not? It needs to go back to, is that a place you want to invest in? Is that an asset you want to own? Is it in your model? And some people just don't want to do it. Some people, I only want to do trustee stuff in Texas. I only want to, and if that's your business plan, that's fine. At some point, like anybody else, perfect example, I'm watching CNBC this morning, and I don't pay attention to this stuff. I was like, when is Howard Schultz not the CEO of Starbucks anymore? He's like, that's a while. But anyway, they're talking about how are they expanding their offerings in stores. Yeah. So now Starbucks is doing this new thing. So think about a note business. Starbucks now wants to offer a different type of food. Well, shit. I've capped out on what we're doing. We're doing really good. Uh, now I need to go to Ohio because Texas doesn't work anymore and I have to go play in a judicial state. It may be you're limited by your capital. And you start with your best your best opportunity, the best deal you can go after, the best thing you can find. And when those transition to something else or you learn another tip or trick for what you like, I think it's like anything else. You just make the adjustment there for you because... If, you know, we're talking about doing a PPM, and I, a, a buddy of mine asked me, why have we not raised our $5 million? And I was like, because I don't have $5 million of stuff I want to go buy, and I don't want a credit card that expires in 30 days, and I just have to go buy stuff and be forced into making decisions in markets that don't look right. So if you've only got 100 grand to invest, 100 grand's a good investment base. It's a good start. It's a lot different when you're managing four or five million dollars and you have to go out and find stuff to make that return to cover velocity. So at first, I would narrow down to be greedy. Be whatever, just whatever you want is gonna make you Are you happy. ever looking to take private capital? I don't know. It's just uh, the only reason why I ask is the other issue sometimes with like a long hold state is going to be the fact that your deal isn't going to finish out for a while, right? Obviously, right, it's a long hold sure. state. Right. So, by proxy, if you were also looking to raise capital, say in two years, that was going to be your goal, okay. and you're in a state like New York where it might take three or four, what have you, not going to happen, right? Because your deal might not be done by then. So now you don't have this really great thing to go market around and say okay. potentially you've done deals, you've got a portfolio started, all this other stuff. You won't have any any skins on the wall to show yet, right? right. So that's another. It's a, just again, it goes back to the model and what you're looking at. So essentially, if you're ever looking to raise capital, judicial state's great, right? But like maybe one that's a little bit shorter, just so that way you can get a skin on the wall, you can get a deal done, maybe get. Your portfolio started, so by time yeah. two years, three years comes down the road, you actually have something to show people, as opposed to, uh, yeah, I'm still in a deal and it still hasn't closed. And, uh, and I, I can give you a good tip on that for anybody that's they're starting, but you've got access to outside capital and you want to have proof of concept, you will pay through the nose for it. So you're not getting a deal. Go find one of these funds that's getting ready that has an asset that's getting ready to go to foreclosure and you're two to three months teed up from foreclosure, you should be out of that deal in less than six months, assuming they don't file bankruptcy. And the catch is you're never gonna be able to control that because it's just gonna happen. It's just part of the business. But if you can get into one of these deals where you're paid up and you know the foreclosure sale, like right now, I was looking at a tape the other day, foreclosure sales May 4th or something like that. Okay, I'm gonna pay through the nose for it, but I got a deal, and I can do a write-up for it, and I can show you that I own it. Now I've got a and case I can study. Show you the wire transfers. <laughs> I have proof of concept. <laughs> so that's a free. I mean, if, yeah. if, if that's what you need to do to build marketing, you'll make. You know, it's very 6%. true. Did you buy the note? Did you turn it into an asset? And did you make your money back? Yeah. They don't need to know that you didn't find the attorney and that you didn't see the property and didn't do all this. You also listen to Note NBA podcast. You have a lot of resources. No, you did not say that. You're not, you're not allowed to use that. You didn't say that. But no, that's, that's essentially the same disclaimer. thing. Yeah, yeah, where is this recording? I'm not attacked. No, but, uh, but, no. but no, it's essentially the same thing from the exact opposite angle, right? Like if you're if it's something that you need to go get done, go do the deal. Go find, um, the way I got started was uh, found a, a guy that was wanted to know, he got what A to Y was, but he wanted to know what Z was. What does a performer look like? I just went and got him a performer. He wanted 12, I found a performer for 15, I made three, you know, I mean nothing, right? But like he got it. Oh, this is what this will look like when it's done. Let's go do more. Like, it's done, like that, that might not be the best, whatever, but like we were literally done and done, month and a half, we had our payments in and now we're on down the road. And he's given me a little more capital sense and now I've got a case study I can go run with. 
It's and it's also true. I yes, mean, right. and everything's true. Lot, lot no, yeah. everybody. Here's the other thing: is everybody? <laughs> it's totally true. The, the challenge that I had in, in a, like my circle, I got education or the mastermind or the people. Listen, I can't spend what's in your bank account. So congratulations <laughs> if it's a really big number. I'm happy Whoa. for you. I wouldn't spend it anyway. I'd be on the beach hanging out. But if that first note you buy is only a five or ten thousand dollar note, but you evaluate it right, who cares? You don't have, don't go look at somebody that's buying three hundred thousand dollar notes. It just you know if you got to drive the Corolla, drive the Corolla and own it. Just keep it clean, keep your Corolla clean and own the Corolla. That's all you got to do with it, and that's the basis for getting started, and getting comfortable. Because to be honest. Ego being what it is, I didn't take a dollar from anybody until I put my money into deals and was able to do it because I couldn't have a strike. I wouldn't have been able to pass the smell test going, so Ryan, I'm doing this note thing and I'm not going to make any eye contact with you, but I'm really good at it and I'm with these guys and they told me I could do it. Can I get 80 grand for this deal? And you're like, why would, why would I get 80 grand? But you'd be like, hey man, I just finished this deal. It was a small deal in Evansville, Indiana. Not really sure why I bought it there, but I heard we can fly into Owensboro. <laughs> We made we made four grand on it. And I was, he was, like, was like, it's not a ton of money, but you know, we made a little over twenty percent on it, and we did that in four months. So really, we made sixty percent on our money. We got this other deal; it's twenty-five grand. I know you were talking the other day. You sold something that had like forty grand. What are you doing with it? You want to you want a JV on this one? So you got a baby step. I was not buying half a million dollar notes the first year I did the business. You're not churning that kind of stuff. You shouldn't expect to, and if you do. Good on you, and I hope you do fantastic, because I only want everybody to make money. But if you need to get past that first little hurdle, which whether it's your own ego, or your wife, or somebody doesn't have a supportive partner, because that's a challenge, no that's money, another part of no it. Money. You don't have money, yeah. You're gonna sit there and beat yourself up and talk about all these things, but those that's the baby step. Sometimes it, it goes back to, and no offense, but sometimes you have to get the shut up check. I don't know if everybody's heard of it, but you gotta go do that $15,000 deal and make the 4,000, you don't get a penny of it. You hand it to somebody, go go buy some shoes or that ridiculous purse that you saw on that ridiculous thing, or let's go on vacation. Spend every dollar of it. But those are the things that get some buy-in from a family member, the buy-in from the business partner, the buy-in from an uncle. Use your family money. If you got a rich dad or a rich uncle, don't let somebody judge you because you got access to more money. Take advantage of it. If you're tall, you usually play basketball or volleyball, right? And if you don't, be jealous quietly. Yeah, that's probably a good way to look at it too. <laughs> You know, I think there's a, a lot of different angles with that stuff. A lot of it is really the biggest hurdle with everybody does is you just got to get in the pool. Jump in the water, the water's warm. If you need to get in the shallow wind, hey, take the steps. Take your time. There's people that are going to cannonball up the high dive the first time. You're like, he is crazy. And you're like, I want to do that. You're like, someday maybe I'll do that. But I'm just going to start with the toothpick for right now. And just jump off and jump in. So thoughts on next phase of notes or other questions? I have a question. How do you know your story? How do you, how do you got into this from the, the bottom? Pop? Yeah. I don't know Chase's. I thought I told it. Uh, the first remember. episode. So I, I was, uh, yeah, here we go. A little uh, retelling of it. No, so I was a mortgage banker and uh, I was a loan originator for a long time. And then um, I got pretty good at it pretty quick, getting business because uh, I'm decent at marketing. And uh, they said, hey, come teach our old LOs that don't know what they're doing. Uh, and so slowly I became kind of the marketing director and business developer of the mortgage company uh, as a whole. And then I'm really good at it, so I made it look easy. So they thought they could get a 23-year-old to come in, uh, fresh out of college, and do the exact same stuff. And that was a huge mistake, but um, I was actually let go uh, around Christmas, right before our second daughter was born. Uh, which is the other reason why I got so aggressive about my first deal. I had to close, like, I went to go find him a performer. I had to get aggressive because I, I needed something to go market. I needed to market a deal, right? Um, so that's what happened. That's how I, I got into uh, the business because I had familiarity with the mortgage side. I got the secondary market. I understood, I wanted to be a real estate investor. And San Antonio was on the upswing, so it'd be a little tough to do traditional. Um, and uh, I got notes, I got paper, I understood the mortgage side of it. Um, and I uh, was lucky enough to um, meet some great people and, uh, and partner with some really great people, but um, somebody helped me get into the business a little faster than I would have otherwise. And that was a, a stressful and a, a nice uh, weight gain opportunity for me. But uh, but that's how I got in. It was, it was really uh, almost pushed off the diving board, you know, to use his analogy. Um, but yeah, that was it. I mean, I, I had a little bit of knowledge. 
um, and I just had to I had to go make it happen. I had to make it work. So and I and I parlayed some of my time. Like somebody was asking me earlier, um, he's a software developer. And he was like, you know, how did you make that transition? You know, it, it's a little tough, you know, just straight out of the gate. And I said, well, yeah, you know, I parlayed my, my marketing knowledge. I went and helped some small businesses. I did, you know, some other stuff. I wasn't able to just straight invest, you know. But it was always the focus, you know, it was always what I was after. And I just used the other knowledge I had. You know, if you're a developer, go help, uh, you know, a local business start a website. Or if you're, you know, whatever it is, you might have another skill. And if you're really that either gung-ho in leaving a W-2 or they're that gung-ho in you leaving your W-2, um, um, you know, you might have to do something like that, but um, yeah, so that's how I got in, and, and like I said, I, I just got it, and it made sense, but uh, I had to I had to get after it really quickly. That's why your question about the buy and hold in a slightly larger, the whole time, to me, would have been a total crash and burn scenario, like, because it would have taken too long to have that proof. I would have showed up even worse than he would have, right? Because I would have been like, oh, sir, excuse me, can I borrow some? It would have been awful. Uh, but I was able to sit down with somebody and go, here's the deal, slide across the table. This is what we do, here it is. This is what the end result looks like. We buy it when it isn't performing because we get to make more money and they're like, okay. And then, you know, they're already listening and then you can go through it. So that's how I got it. That's what Mine was very, I had no choice. Yeah, I didn't, yeah. Uh, so I bought, First purchase I bought notes was like, was like 75 grand. I bought two notes. I bought a $50,000 note the next month. Did about 250 the following month, and then I was out of my money. And I called dad for 150, and then that month I did 150. I raised 150 from another investor, and I think that was probably about the sixth month I had been actively buying because I'd gotten in with the, some of the money I'd bought the first go round. I had one start reperforming, and I had one deed in lieu, and I was like proof of concept. And then the other thing is, like, I was in these events. The value of your network and marketing, whether it's a real estate investment group coming to one of these things, you you have to talk. It's trouble for the introverts, so it's one of the things to work on. But I was just like, hey, I got this deal. And then the biggest thing is, is how do you make it easy? I've got a bunch of friends that work with me, and things that I've done. And separate from this, last year I did a development deal with, I bought the land, but I got a buddy to put all of his credit online, and he got 15% of the deal, not a big cut, but I packaged it to him in the most beautiful way. I was like, here's the land, here are the numbers, you don't have to think about it, here's your risk, here's your downside, and here's what it looks like. If you can present a deal like that, and it does come to marketing, I can tell you mine are pretty sloppy, but the numbers are good and I can have the conversation a lot easier than most people can, because I don't, I don't need the script. But I've got a buddy of mine that's new in the space. Man, if you saw what his proposals look like, they're beautiful and they're polished. You know, I don't know if the numbers are as good, but the report looks good. And, and some of that really is, is what you need to do. It's like, it's like a job interview. How are you gonna show up to your job interview? It really depends. So um, the raising the capital thing though, a lot of it they just came to coincide with comfort people that I knew had capital and they knew I was active. I was doing stuff, I was talking about it, asking questions and, and doing stuff. Um, necessity. Necessity, Mine yeah. was pretty easy. Just, just and, necessity. And then we started New kids that, and yeah. stuff. You know, and then just, you know, just started raising more and more money in yeah. smaller chunks and then that'll change. You know, I had a buddy of mine that I, he had 10 grand to do a JV deal with and we did a JV deal with and he made $4,000 in less than a year on it. It's great. And now I don't really want to do much if it's not, I don't want to buy an asset that's under $100,000. And it's it's not because the other ones, are, I don't want to tell anybody, I buy all those cheap ones with my money because the yields are retarded. It's crazy. But I don't want to deal with filling out the paperwork. And, but man, from day one, if you had 10 or 15 grand, I was your guy. We were having conversations. Let me find you, you, a, low, me find you this, a low budget man. deal. We'll get in there. Because <laughs> the same way a lot of people, you don't know who has money and who doesn't. But you have to be comfortable with taking money. The other aspect, of, like even where I'm at now, I, I don't take on more JV capital than I personally have in assets that I own. So that it'd take a 50% cut in the market for me to lose a dollar of their money. Because the biggest problem I will tell you, you will see, and there are people who, I will never name names, but it's the most disgusting thing, who treat other people's money 
as though it's their own to willy-nilly with it. And I treat my money like dirt so I can go take care of their money and make sure their money's protected. And you become a steward of their money. You don't have a legal fiduciary responsibility, but you got a legal responsibility as soon as you take that money. So part of it is, is do you tell the story and how you do it? Yeah. But can you back it up and are you confident that you'll get up off your ass and go do the work when you need to? That's the other part of it. And, and a lot of this stuff is we're doing things that the people that are around you aren't doing. I go back to this and I've talked about it on the show. How many of your friends are like, what the hell are you guys doing taking three days to go to Vegas to the conference? So many people congratulate, oh, going to Vegas. Oh, yeah. I'm like, come we've been We've been up every morning at 6 a.m. going to, I mean, you know. Yeah. It, it's a different thing, but it's it's not a normal thing in society. I don't know. We everybody follows different influencers, but people that are taking the time out of this to do this your weekend, most of your friends are miserable doing something yeah. else. And they're congratulations. Listen, for and hell, you might be miserable. He's been listening to me moan about my relationship for the last two weeks. But I'm exhausted. Let's I'm exhausted <laughs> at his exhaustion. It's, it's, I'm like, babe, I'm calling my wife. You'll, uh, it won't. It won't stop. But but the other aspect is it is. Sometimes you just got to admit to it and say, hey, listen, I'm not happy at my job. I want to do something a little bit different. And that little step of action and that little step of motivation is the stuff that really gives you the foundation to either, A, make this a great hobby. And if you don't want to buy 100 notes, don't. There's no reason to. It's not a game. It's not a competition. Like I said, you're playing your own rule. You get to spin this world around the sun as much as you want to for as long as you want to do what you want to. But it's, it's one of these things that I think you guys are already here, you're talking about due diligence and buying notes and how do we do it. The biggest thing you guys gotta get is between your ears. The biggest, our, our most popular episodes are the goal episodes, the mindset episodes, the ones where, you know, we were talking about earlier, one of our favorite authors, Ryan Holiday, likes to say that if you don't define what your number is, the answer is always gonna be more. Right, so if you define for you that like what you need, what you're comfortable with, where you wanna live, where you wanna travel, whatever, that's 100 grand, 10%, right? So you need to raise a million dollars. Because you can get 10 for yourself off that and kind of a million dollars. It's just not a lot of money. It really isn't in terms of how you're going to be able to go out and do it. How, it's not a lot of deals. It's not a lot of that. It, that's a really attainable number in JV Capital. Like crazy attainable number in JV Capital. And there's a lot of people I know that would love to be at the $100,000 mark, right? So if you define that for yourself, now you can just now you know what you're etching at, right? I need ten investors with hundred grand, or I need fifty, you know, and, and then you, that's what you can go after. I know the type of deals I need to look at. I know the type of yields I need to look at. And now it's just a math equation. You put that on the board, and you just go tick. I got another one. Tick. I got another one. Tick. I got another one. And now you're at your hundred thousand dollar mark. So and for, done. for what it's he fun. said, we're sitting here. We started. We said, hey, who who doesn't have a no? Who wants one? Not the hands went up as quickly, but that's why we're all here. Yeah. I would garner, or I would garner a guest that I would not to garner. We have a podcast. What I would assume is that less than 10% of you guys actually have that written down on your goals for this year that you want to buy a note. Stan's my got man. it on his mind. My man. And I, I like that. I want to be challenged by that, and I'm glad that you said you did. Because the best thing is, thanks for raising your hand. It doesn't make anyone not having it bad. I think it just makes it easy when you write it down. Yeah. If you're one of those people that keeps it in your head, great. i got to write stuff down because I forget it. But writing that down makes it to the point where you're going to press yourself now and be like, I need to find out more about the due diligence. So what sounds better? Me watching another episode of Billions or figuring out who to Google that's close to me and I can go take the title officer to watch and be like, listen, I don't have a clue about this stuff. But this is what I'm getting ready to do. Can you tell me what I need to look out for? Or how can you help me? Or what would it cost me to have you help me? Explain it to me like a second grade. Like yeah. for real. Because you're going to have to go back to an investor occasionally and be like, oh, so here's what we're going to And that just proves that your expertise, improves that all that. It's the, what is it, Richard Feynman. That's how he'd have people try to explain stuff to him. You know, and he's a fairly intelligent dude, right? So he would just have people explain to him like he's a second grader. Go do the same thing. Go find the experts. We, um, we had, uh, what's his name, Pro Title, um, Alex Godofsky on the show. Get, if you get your title pulled from uh, Pro Title USA, you call, Alex call, him. call him. Pro Title. Like, what am I him. looking at? And they're going to sit there and go over it with you. Oh, here's what you need to look at. Here's a red flag. Here's what this means. What is this about? They'll go over it with you. Like bananas that people would buy this thing and be like, oh, God, what are Call them. Yeah. And there's, I think there's other ways to backstop, which we don't, we don't necessarily get into, and you'll... It comes down to your skillful negotiation or anything else, but like you, you start looking at notes and you start looking at collateral and you're not sure what you have. Maybe you need to send it to Richmond Monroe and get a Bailey letter. Which then that really comes down to how can you 
build your relationship with the seller because most sellers aren't going to play that game. They want your money, they want it wired, and you'll get your collateral when you get it. It's just the way the market works. But you'll find buyers that will work with you. Now, what are you, what are you going to do for that? You're going to pay a premium, obviously, because it's more of their time or more of their energy or anything else. But if you're looking to like be a little bit more secure, have a little bit more information, or have somebody else hold your hand through that, those resources are there. And, you know, we always say, you know, I make a joke, but it's true. Like, I'm paying for a semester of college about once a month with something I screw up. You find somebody that can help you, you save the 6000 you lose the 6000 you make the 12000 you don't. Maybe you make a little less because you had to pay somebody to come help you. It just depends on how you guys want to do it. I, you know, measure twice, cut once. Measure once, cut twice. You know, it just depends. There's, there's a million ways to do it. So many people in this room are doing it differently. All I know is that you know, I don't know that I'm doing it the right way. I know that most months I make more money than I lose. <laughs> And that's my goal, among other ones. But is it written down? for what you guys want to do? That is written. That is written. It's worded a little differently. It's worded a little differently. But you know, the other thing is, you know, if you look around the room, the vendors, you know, we're all in alignment. Listen, I want to make money. I want to have fun. I want to be happy. You know, the money is just the thing that we use to get us there to whatever the other activity is. But most everyone in this room truly is going to help you. They'll be a vendor. They will want to help you. Yeah, you got to trade some money for it, or you got to trade something else. But they're there to help you because here's what happens: if you guys go out and you overpay for a note, or you screw a deal up and you get yelled at, or you get chastised, and you're never going to buy a note again, what good are you to anyone in this industry as a partner or as a vendor? You go away. You disappear and you go into the ether. So that's the one thing that we reinforce is most everybody is out here to help you while they're helping themselves. And it's a, everybody needs to win. It's the same way to treat the relationships with borrowers. We talked about it right now. Where I've got a gal right now, we're negotiating a short sale. And, you know, she's scared I'm just going to go give her a boot and throw her on the street. And it's just like, no, you don't need to worry about that. Just go find a place and when you find it, let me know and I'll pay the deposit. So what? Well, yeah, because you need some cardboard boxes from U-Haul, we can have them shipped to the house. It'll take me five minutes to get on U-Haul.com and send you 50 boxes. That's real easy, and it builds you a lot of goodwill. And even when you're dealing with them, you got to remember, it's, it's got to be a win for everybody at the end of the day with a lot of this stuff. Um, questions? Anything else? What else we got? First experience. First experience? Wow. Um, I'd say four four twenty five. Yeah, four twenty five. But when I say four twenty five, the other thing you guys need to do, please don't spend all your money. Yeah, please. <laughs> That's you know, the other thing. Talk maybe about some people money. in the rehab industry may be familiar that it costs you a little extra money when you get inside of a property. You're gonna have other expenses show up. Yeah. So you want to have a war chest. Yeah, you need to have the best you can. You know, I, I can tell you right now, just our JVs alone, on an average month, we pro I probably have about four hundred thousand dollars that are paying for other rehabs or overages and deals where I didn't take enough money from my JV. But I have a, I have a thing for me. I don't go back to the well. I'm gonna and I don't you know I don't get any interest on that money. That money's just sitting there working. In reality, I wouldn't put that money into the deal if I wasn't going to make a little bit more back on it. But it benefits the JV partner too. Yeah. But you need to have that cash. Because the one thing you don't want to get in that situation where you get a property back, you're like, if I wholesale this, we make four grand. If I just had 20 extra thousand, we make 18 grand. So, how do you start that? Do you have that as like How do you? So I will, I will, I will, I will answer this without answering it because I am not an attorney, and everybody has a different JV agreement. So I actually had a conversation with three other investors, with two of my clients that are here in a circle. It's very interesting. Yeah, <laughs> and you have to talk yeah. that way. Like, in, in all reality, the deals are all pretty structured the same. Your, your JV deals don't have to be structured the same. Yeah. To be honest, your JV deal, your win-win, is to give that investor the highest rate of return they want while giving them the least amount of the return that they need of mine. But in, how do we structure those things? With them, my JVs are just, it's a 50-50 profit split. You're gonna give me what the asset is, plus some holding, some cash for an operating fund. If it goes over that, I gotta, I come to the well. I, I go take my money and I pay for it. Yeah, I can do whatever I want to. Yeah, Because I hold all the assets in my company. 
Everybody does it different. Some people put it in a trust. Some people want a different LLC. I don't like paperwork, and I'm, I'm the hardest working lazy person you're going to meet. So why would I fill out four extra sheets of paper if at the end of the day it's not going to make a damn bit of difference? And the catch is, we all have to treat it differently. When I first started taking capital, man, I would jump through hoops. You could put one on fire for 10 grand, I was coming through it. At the end of the day now, if you don't trust me enough or you don't like it or you need that verification, we're, I'm just not the right guy for you to do business with. And you should, and I would, I would want everybody to treat the people that are around them or the treat people in their circles because the guy that's going to ask those many questions and do it is just going to cost you time, which is money at the end of the day. And if you're not secure enough in the investment, you shouldn't be making it. I will say, you hear him saying this, it's gonna, that is going to be a tough, like it's tough. Because you hear him say that, right? Like the guy that's gonna, the girl that's gonna, and someone's gonna come to you, and they're gonna have the money, and they're gonna be sounding like kind of a pain in the ass, and you're gonna be like, but they got the money. But Robbie said, and you're like, but they got the money. But every time, it's gonna, it'll bite you in the ass every time. Every time. At least that's my experience. Yeah. So. Any other thoughts, questions? <laughs> Diligence Pro, is it live? So she was at, you were yeah, so it, uh, it should be live in about five days. We got an email this morning, <laughs> super early, from the uh, developer that said everything was working on the consumer side, so the client side, y'all side. He's double checking everything on the server side for our stuff, for security, all that kind of stuff. And he should, he's testing it over the weekend, everything should be good. So yeah. 97 bucks a year. Yeah. So less than $8 a month. <laughs> yeah. So. Good One day. of those unicorn frappuccinos and a dollar tip. Unicorn frappuccinos. Yeah, you haven't seen that? I went yeah. to Starbucks the other day. They I were thought sold some people out. were getting like jacked up on them. They're kind of getting it looks, sick. It looks chemically potent. It looks <laughs> a little rough. It you know what it looks like? You guys ever seen the Squatty Potty commercial? I have seen the Squatty Potty commercial. It looks like on the end of the Squatty Potty commercial ice cream cone. For people that don't know how the banter happens on the show, this is it right here. Someone talks about a unicorn frapp and now it's This is literally what we do. Yeah. Um, we appreciate everybody, by the way, yeah, coming man, out, you. coming by the table. Thank you for the, anybody that's listening to the podcast. Yeah. Thank you. And like we, I know what we ask it, we say, it. talking about getting into new into notes or new spaces. If you guys, a vendor you're not sure about or somebody you want to talk about or you're curious, ask at notembaa.com and send us an email. Let us know. We are trying to get interviews from more and more people. I like talking about the deals, but I also we got a little bit of a hiccup talking about deals that the borrower found out. The, the deal. So. You know, it turns into a different type it's, of negotiation. It's a little bit of a... Uh, and the borrower knows that I'm talking about their house. So we're going to do a couple of interviews for a few weeks. And, uh, no, no. Uh, we would love to do more interviews with anybody that you guys encounter at an event. So we can't obviously make it to every event. If you're, you know, killing it in a, in a state that we don't invest in and your attorney is just lights out, you know, whatever it is, if, you're, if you've got somebody that you... You, you know exists that you'd love to hear from, you know, and you want to have them on the show, definitely send us an email. Um, we would love to, you know, be able to handle that for you guys. And uh, I'll probably, by the way, this is all live, right? This will be on, this will be this week's show that's supposed to go out Wednesday, so appreciate you guys participating, and uh, there will be an actual outro, but uh, just remember, tell five other people yeah. you know about the Know to Be a Podcast. We appreciate it. All right. Thanks, guys. Thank you. All right. Easy breezy.